Hello everybody, this is Francesco Costa, interventional cardiologist from the University Hospital of Messina in Italy. Today I have the honor and pleasure of hosting uh, Professor Roxana Meran from the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Thank you, Professor Meran, for being here and uh, for uh, communicating us these important results. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Thank you for having me. So, Professor Meran is uh, one of the major experts in the field of antithrombotic therapy, we will talk about uh, high bleeding risk patients. Thank you. So, Professor Meran, uh, could you give us a, a very flash summary of what the science short DAPT program was and uh, what are the main study results? So, you know, there have been so many now new trials on focusing on high bleeding risk uh, patients after. Philippe Bourbon and investigators published the Leaders Free program, which was really one of a kind, including patients that were previously excluded from all clinical trials and, um, and really evaluating this high bleeding risk uh, patients in a shortened duration of DAPT. And that study was just so important uh, that it, it's really very important for us to better understand how to treat the high bleeding risk patients because while they have a high um, rate of bleeding, they also are um, uh, very complex with a lot of uh, risk factors and they also have ischemic events. So how do you decide um, what's the optimal duration of dual antiplatelet therapies in high bleeding risk patients? So do they all, should they all get just one month? Is there a certain patient who would do better with three months? Um, and, you know, and, and how do we uh, do this in a stent platform that um, has been studied more than any other stent, honestly, over the last decade? And so that was sort of the background by which we felt it was important um, to um, think about the Zion stent, which is a cobalt chromium uh, uh, platform on the multi-link design. It has a durable fluoropolymer, and for many who don't know that, the, this fluoropolymer has a special property of retaining albumin and minimizing platelet adhesion. Uh, and while everyone is kind of working on biodegradable polymers, we're forgetting that this particular polymer coating has been well studied in preclinical studies to show that there is true passivation and a very, very good, um, you know, antiplatelet properties with the drug Everolimus. And um, so we wanted to kind of study that and a short DAP program was put forth by Abbott, completely supported and sponsored by the company to evaluate um, in patients with high bleeding risk whether one month or three months of dual antiplatelet therapies is safe. Uh, and can we reduce bleeding compared to 12 months? And do we not cause harm in these high bleeding risk patients? So in about 3,600 patients, 2,000 in the Zions 90, 1,600 in uh, Zions 28, uh, we sought to uh, move forward and study these patients in single arm studies. These were not randomized and it's a major limitation of this program, but it really had to do with um, getting the three months sort of done, especially with US patients, and then moving towards a one month once we had the three months uh, data done. And so we were able to kind of put this together in high bleeding risk patients and evaluate it. That's great. Could you tell us what the results were? Yeah, well, we included high bleeding risk patients. So uh, most, if not all, the average number of criteria of HBR criteria was 1.5 and 1.6 for each of the trials. Uh, we found that in Zions 90, where the evaluation period was with aspirin monotherapy, not P2Y12 monotherapy. So things have changed. We might even get a better result with P2Y12 monotherapy, but with aspirin monotherapy between three to 12 months and in, in the Zions 28, it was between one to six months. 
And what we found is that the hard endpoint of DEF and MI uh, was not inferior of uh, using propensity score stratification across five quintiles so we don't lose a single patient in the Zions 90 or Zions 28. If you did propensity matching, you might lose patients. We didn't want to do that. And um, th we showed really basically um, non-inferior. We met both the primary endpoint of Zions 90 and Zions 28 were met by, um, by a good margin, actually. And uh, while we saw a trend towards a reduction of BARC 2 to 5 bleeding, it was important to note that BARC 2 bleeds weren't being mandated, collected from uh, Zions v. USA, which was the comparator arm. So we um, looked at BARC 3 and 5, and there was a significant reduction in the, main, in the major severe bleeding, BARC 3 to 5. And the stent thrombosis rates were extremely low on, on aspirin monotherapy, 0.2%. Uh, in uh, between um, uh, three to six months and 0.3% between one to six months. So extremely low, uh, meeting pretty much all of the criteria. And I think really showing that at a platform like the Zion Stent um, in high bleeding risk patients performs extremely well, even with uh, monotherapy. And in these high bleeding Ooh. risk patients, an option of reducing this to 30 days or 90 days is going to be acceptable, definitely, in terms of not causing increased ischemic events and reducing major bleeding. Um, Dr. Valjamigli and I um, we are planning to actually uh, do a comparative analysis between one to three months. Obviously, it's not the same. It wasn't randomized, et cetera, but I think it's going to be really important to see, are there certain high bleeding risk patients who should get three months versus one month? But honestly, um, it looks very, very good for both, both uh, durations at the moment. These data are remarkable. We know that, uh, especially for BARC 3 and 5 bleeding, these are events that have a big impact. So reducing these events is, uh, is really saving lives among our patients. And uh, I also noted that the rate of stent thrombosis, which are uh, exceptional, I think, especially in this setting of high-risk patients. Uh, you mentioned the characteristic of the stent, so, and you mentioned that prior bench testing showed that this, the coating, the fluoroporimol coating of the client stent showed to be even less thrombogenic than the same bare metal stent platform. Yeah. So, Having yes. a coding could be useful. So mm -hmm. um, my question to you, do you think that these very low stent thrombosis rates are specific for this kind of stent? Or could be, or do we have data in the literature that uh, found these kind of figures also for other novel, I mean, I novel think, stent platform? Look, I think that the, um, it's hard to say if you're, you're not doing a comparative analysis between two stent um, platforms to to uh, to you know definitively prove that the Zion stent is that these data are just for the Zion stent, but they really are just for the Zion stent because we don't have data in the same trial with other with other stents. And um, uh, I do think though that when we were looking at some of the uh, data from other stent platforms where their, the comparator arm was Zions, um, they didn't seem to do better. If anything, it was a little bit worse what, that what we saw with the biodegradable polymer um, uh, data from host, for example, host ACS study um, that uh, was there to show that maybe the biodegradable polymer was going to be safer and more effective. That really didn't pan out. Uh, the Svelte study didn't pan out. I mean, it was just interesting to see that uh, the Zion stent seemed to, to do extremely well. Okay, and uh, again, also for the very low stent thrombosis rate, we are confident that these patients are uh, more or less protected from this kind of uh, complications. And considering the fact that today we have a lot of patients that are undergoing complex PTI, even I mean, you being, know, I, in my mind, I think if you're performing complex PCI in a high bleeding risk patient in whom you really want to reduce the duration of DAPT, you better do a really, really good job during your PCI using imaging, guiding imaging, and uh, using FFR guided 
uh, you know, techniques so that you're not really over stenting. Uh, and that if you are stenting, that you are um, doing, getting the most optimal, best expansion, uh, achieving the best minimal luminal area. Um, I think the patients deserve it. Uh, they have high, high um, ischemic risk. And I think it's really important that we get a really, really good result, especially when you have a complex morphology in a patient in whom you know they're frail and on an oral anticoagulant or had prior history of bleeding, you really want to get a very, very good result with your PCI. You have studied two different DAPT duration, one month and three months. So um, I, I understand that you have still to perform the analysis, but there is, a, there is something that you think at the time being could inform the division between uh, short DAPT and uh, let's say very short term DAPT? I mean, I still think, you know, even after we do all of these analyses, we're still underpowered for the very rare complications like stem thrombosis or mortality. And I think it's, it, it's really important that uh, we still use clinical judgment using some of the parameters about, you know, how complex and what's the burden of atherosclerosis, what's the ischemic risk, what's the bleeding risk, and really making a decision about that. And one of the other things that we didn't test is um, the use of a P2Y12 monotherapy instead of an aspirin monotherapy. So, you know, there's still a lot to be done in this arena, and I'm hoping to contribute to it. It's about P2Y12 monotherapy, because uh, you have uh, perfectly shown in the Twilight trial what is the role of P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy, also with potent P2Y12 inhibitors. So what do you think is the role of P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy in high bleeding risk patients? when you have to compare it with aspirin? I think, I think in, in, in um, high bleeding risk patients where there is an, uh, a, a big ischemic risk, um, a, a duration, a short duration of a, of a potent agent on board for as long as possible is gonna be really important. I, I really do think that. I think that we showed that a twilight strategy can work in these patients who have high ischemic burden and whom you were worried about also bleeding. But in the extreme conditions like these ones that you just saw, um, I think people are reluctant to use the potent agents because of the bleeding uh, and maybe shortening that duration of dual antiplatelet therapies in twilight we did three months. Maybe, maybe we can um, go shorter than that. Maybe just two weeks of dual antiplatelet therapies with a a, a lower dose of ticagrelor or, or something like that, or um, but none of that has been has been studied. So it really does need to be evaluated prospectively in randomized studies. So there's still a lot more work to be done in this arena. So this is a really exciting uh, field of research. There, yes, there's been uh, dozens of uh, DAPT randomized clinical trial in this field, and actually there there are a lot to a lot to come, and maybe dual antibiotic therapy will not be the term that will be used in the future. But, uh, I don't think so. I, I agree. So, Professor Meran, thank you very much for your time. and this Thank is a you very so much for having me. Thank exciting. you. I, thanks to PCR and my friends and, and for uh, highlighting our study on your, uh, on your web platform, and I look forward to seeing everyone in person at EuroPCR 2021. I hope. I can only pray. And uh, and thank you for including this in your program. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of you for your attention. This was Francesco Costa for PCR Online.